Welcome to the Sarah Andreco Show. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, and even if we start going in the direction of the use of aversives, like even from the standpoint, it's actually one of the things that, that I have presented to the IABC organization on in, in some of the like the principles and practice course, for example, I did a case based uh a module for that, basically saying, what are all of the things that we can consider for these cases? And even if I'm choosing not to use aversives for the reasons of the humane hierarchy, I need to know how they work. I need to know how, yes. if they were to be applied, what would be the rules or the applications? Because chances are my clients are using them. And if they're committed to using them, the least I can do is to help them do it correctly and offer them some rungs lower on that humane hierarchy to fill in some of the gaps they may have missed. But if I'm just taking the high road and basically saying, oh no, I would never, and I would do, wouldn't do this, and I wouldn't do this, and I would, wouldn't take a client who does this, I think we're actually doing a disservice to those pet parents and to the veterinary teams who just don't have other skills or knowledge about those other details. So I am more than happy to go into all of those things without throwing anybody in particular under the bus without potentially even sort of naming names, but even just saying, hey, this is as a responsible professional. Right. This is my opportunity and my obligation to understand the breadth of tools that are available to us. And we can talk about that without endorsing something that we don't fundamentally agree with. Yes, that's that's an excellent point. And honestly, let's roll right into that. I would love to talk more about that. Um, you bring up a really good point about clients already using tools. So, you know, you have a client that goes to their veterinarian and says, this is what I'm doing and this is what I've been taught and this is why I do this. And so they recommend them to another trainer or behavior professional. And the first thing out of that professional's mouth is, oh no, we're getting rid of all this. We don't do this. And you really run the risk of losing that client right off the bat because not only do they feel judged, you know, oh, we got to get rid of that. We got to do away with that. But There's also, I think, sometimes a lack of understanding. Well, the last professional that I had said to do this, and I see some results from that, you know, whether those results are really what you're looking for or, you know, potentially has some other suppression of behaviors or whatever the case may be, you know, you've got a client that's already on board with that. Perhaps we can talk them down to using other tools, but you have to start where they are, essentially. So I like that you bring that up. I think it's important to understand the functionality of all these different tools, whether you use them or not, just like um, medications, I think, are a great example. So, you know, as a behavior consultant, it is not my place to ever give medical advice, but I really need to know what they all do. So whether you're, you know, you're a prescribing veterinarian, you're giving an SSRI, or you're just providing a supplement like Zilkeen or Calming Care, I need to know what effect that has on the dog so that while we're working through a behavior modification plan, I know what to expect. That doesn't mean I'm going to use a medication or recommend a medication, just like tools. Doesn't mean you're going to use a tool or recommend a tool, but you should know what they do and how to use them appropriately so that you can help those clients through those things. And what I love about what you're highlighting there, Sarah, is that collaborative aspect too. So I can, you know, if I were functioning as a trainer or a behavior consultant, I could ask that veterinary team, what does this do? What are the applications for why this is being prescribed or recommended to this animal? What can I or should I be watching for within our training or our behavior modification sessions that will then inform you as the veterinary professional whether or not it's actually doing the job you wanted it to do or whether there are side effects or other, you know, even with some of the medications, let's say like gabapentin, for example, or even trazodone, where at the not quite right dose for that particular animal, we can see some sedation. And that's not usually the goal, but it's certainly something that can happen. And the client may or may not be reporting that information back. And so if we're there as professionals working with that client, working with that animal, making direct observations, I love that as an opportunity to reach back out to the veterinary team and say, hey, what do you want me to watch for? That, again, is going to inform you as to whether or not there is a recommendation for a dose adjustment or the timeline of onset of effect. What are we looking for so that it's not you against me or you doing your thing and I'm doing my own thing, oblivious to what's going on? It's like, no, 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 we can we can actually sort of link arms and have the client linked arms with us as well. And we can work collaboratively for the better outcome of everyone truly everyone that's involved in that relationship. 
Exactly. Well, I, I, I often think that primary care vets feel like they're on their own when dealing with something that comes in with behavior. Okay, well, I can throw some floxetine at it and here's a, a card for a dog trainer, <laughs> like, uh, you know, and the rest of that can be kind of tough. And so um, I, I love bringing in that collaborative approach because there are so many tools in the behavior toolbox, so many other people out there that can help on that team. And again, it's not a you do your thing or I do my thing. You know, I make it a habit of sending all of my behavior modification plans to the primary care vet. I want to keep them in the loop and on board. So I think from a just a, a record-taking perspective or, or medical note perspective, I think a lot of emphasis needs to be put on behavior there too. So when you do get some of that feedback, either from a dog trainer or even a board-certified veterinary behaviorist because you've pulled them in for a vet-to-vet consult, like really making a lot of notations about that behavior, what you're looking for, what changes you expect, and then keeping in touch with that client along the way to say, yes, I'm seeing these changes or no, I'm not. So just like you do your TPRs walking in the door anytime you see a patient for a physical, you got your behavior TPR as well. Like, am I seeing any changes? You know, have I checked in with the client? Yes. And the additional analogy that I'll use there too, in addition to like the vitals and that sort of that quick assessment, where am I at in this point in time? I love using the analogy for veterinary team members about doing pain assessments. Because if you have an animal that's Mm -hmm. hospitalized for four hours, eight hours, 72 hours, whatever the case may be, you don't just do a pain assessment as they walk through the door and then assume you know what that pain level is going to do for the duration of the hospitalization period. Yes. It is dynamic and it changes based on stress. It changes based on medications. It changes based on treatments. It changes based on all of these factors. And so You know, whether it's every two hours, every one hour, every six hours, whatever is appropriate for that dynamic process, we're already in the habit of reassessing. But for whatever reason, we tend to, and myself included, we're like, oh, I've met you. I know what you're going to do, right? You're going to lay there just like that the whole time. And that's what you're going to tolerate in terms of care. And we forget that this may be a dog who's very, very comfortable with people, but highly stressed by the sound of a dog barking, for example. And so what we saw in the consult room or what we saw in the treatment area in one moment is not necessarily the way that animal is going to show up five minutes later. And remaining open and aware of that without making potentially damaging or problematic assumptions is super helpful. And yet what I what I find for so many veterinarians and, and team members within the veterinary profession is that behavior often feels like an other. Where it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'll, I'll deal with the physical stuff. I'll deal with that TPLO. I'll deal with this. But the behavior is an other. And so much of what we're already doing can tap into the skill set that we already have. In fact, so many good veterinarians and veterinary staff members are already using behavior to inform their decisions they may not have the vocabulary or the understanding of what they're reading, but it's already there. And so that's, you know, speaking of sort of meeting people where they are, I try to do the same thing when I'm, when I'm working with veterinary team members to say, Hey, what do you already have in the toolbox that we can tap into that we can really, you know, exaggerate and expand on those skills versus me saying, you know, standing back as the professional saying, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. Nobody wants to listen to that. I don't care what your credentials are, (laughs) but let's talk, let's talk collaboration. What do you already got that we can lean on and really utilize? I love that. You know, and it, it, it always goes back to, and and this is the same for dog trainers to me as it is any medical profession, any technician, any nurse, any veterinarian, you know, just step back for a second. What happens when you don't have all of these tools? So finding out what tools you do have, what you do use, but more importantly, relying on your own internal skills and even your trained skills. You know, I I always love the thought of walking up to, you know, they don't love this, but walking up to a technician, a surgery technician in surgery, right? And just grabbing the surgery vet cord and unplugging it and being like, now what? You know, (laughs) you know what to do. Don't panic. Who cares if it's not making noise? Get out your stethoscope, count your respirations, check for that eye position, you know, look at your gum color. Like you got this, you're good. And so it is the same thing. It's kind of walking into any practice, no matter what you have or what you don't have, you still have a skill set. You still have some training and you can still start with what you have and kind of progress from there. And maybe you add some tools here and there, but you also never really should become completely reliant on that either because, you know, behavior, as you said, it's, you know, it's a snapshot in time. It's, it's ever changing, ever flowing. So something might work, uh, you know, at this visit, but the next visit, you know, maybe something got poisoned or maybe this dog has caught on to a routine or a pattern you didn't realize was there, you know, so it's always changing, ever changing. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think for some people, that's the scary part of it is that it isn't static. You know, you, yes. it is changing every time. It's like, wow, like there's so much that I need to learn to even be able to start providing meaningful feedback. And, and I get that, right? To be, to be functioning at the level of a specialist. Yes. You need the whole toolbox. You need all of the things to understand the medical and the physical and the physiological and the pharmacological. And yes, you need all of that. But you can do a lot of really good stuff at more of an introductory level, even just starting to recognize what it is that we're actually seeing in front of us with an awareness of body language and an awareness of you know, something I like to really stress when I'm talking about that is we say body language and we sort of forget that the second word of that phrase is language. It's a conversation. And it gives us the opportunity to really, you know, people say, well, gosh, as a veterinarian, wouldn't it be great if you could talk to animals? I'm like, well, you kind of can, <laughs> yeah. right? Like where you put your eyes, where you put your hands, how you hold yourself in space, the fluidity of your motions versus sort of the, 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 the more sharp staccato type movements. If I'm working with an animal that appears a bit more reserved or withdrawn, you can be darn sure that I'm going to be holding my hands and my body sort of all within the frame so that I'm not making huge dramatic gestures. I'm going to start minimizing the fluctuations in my vocal tone. And I'm going to be really intentional about trying to, trying to create as much of a sort of velvety tone as I possibly can. And all of it makes a difference. And when you do that and you sort of quiet the entire environment and you see that dog drop the tension in their shoulders, it, it just, it, it almost makes me tear up sometimes because it's like a way of saying, I got you, buddy. Like, I got you. We can do this. Versus me stepping in with my agenda, assuming that I'm able to say, well, I will do to you what I need to get done today. That's not going to work for some of our patients. And when we make that assumption, I think we're, we're really doing ourselves a disservice and we're actually creating trauma in the in the emotional experience of that learner. And gosh, the vast majority of the time, it's completely and totally avoidable. So we've got work to do. We definitely do. And <clears throat> having to take advantage of all the time that we do have to spend with those animals that need a little additional time, because time in particular, I know, is something that's of concern for a lot of primary care physicians. You know, with, with veterinarians, it's often, you know, full books appointments. You've got them coming in. you got to come in out. You might have 15, 30 minutes, maybe max. So it's really hard to stop in that moment and take additional time if you have an animal that needs that. So it helps to know ahead of time, of course, but that's not always possible either. It helps to have a nice full staff, which is also not always possible either. All these lovely little amenities, right? But um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's really where we're training your staff in a, a more robust capacity, especially when it comes to behavior, can really help in situations like that. So if you're a doctor and you're moving appointment to appointment to appointment and you, you, you know, you've got a full book and you've got to keep going, um, that could be somewhere where you can step out momentarily and try to make the animal more comfortable and see what you, a, a technician that you've trained or a nurse that you've trained in behavior can, can kind of help balance that a little bit so that you can continue moving through your schedule and you can do potentially what you need to do, but still take that extra time with that animal. So they might be there longer than their appointment slot, but perhaps they're they're working with the tech for a little while or the nurse for a little while, or somebody else can take over some other duties while you, know, you kind of move about your way. But having some flexibility in what you do with your patients with the time that they're there, as opposed to you've got this 15 minute spot to fill, you know, because Good luck with a fear aggressive dog in 15 minutes. <laughs> you know? Right. The conversation. The next is time that fear aggressive begun. dog sees you. Yes. The next time that animal sees you, it's going to be a 50 minute appointment because yeah. if you don't take the time, it can be very difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the one cool thing you've got going for you, you've got a lot of cool things going for you. I got to be honest. You live in Portland, you're a board certified behaviorist, but. You have all the tools in one place. So you kicked off instinct, um, your instinct dog training. Uh, I think that was last year, 2020, you yep. started that we, up? We opened phase one for instinct Portland in September. So we're, gosh, Excellent. we're coming up on six months already, which is just, uh, I mean, it's both phenomenal. That's and crazy. like, where did, where did that, where did that time go? How did that already happen? <laughs> it's amazing. Yes. You blinked. 
So you've got the dog training piece. You have the medical intervention piece because you're a board certified veterinary behaviorist. I mean, so you have all of these things and <clears throat> it's really cool because it's a one-stop shop. So you can have your team in place and you can really tackle any type of behavioral problem that you are um, approached with. Now, the the what I would love for you to um, expand on is how other people that don't have that one-stop shop can really pull some of these pieces and really use other professionals as part of the team to collaborate and really help some of these very difficult behavior cases that are coming in. Um, I wrote an article last year that was peer reviewed about uh, the title was was supposed to be a little um, catchy, but you know, the difference between a, a dog trainer and a behaviorist. Now we know there are a million other titles out there like certified canine behavior consultant, applied animal behaviorist, board certified, you know, all that stuff. But most people think of either dog trainer or behaviorist. And so the article was meant to kind of break down all these different professions and, you know, who's available. And rather than just throwing a, a, a card, you know, at your client, like, oh, here's a dog trainer, go see them and they'll take care of your behavior problem. Like, which professional should you be teaming up with? And should you be talking to the professional? Should you be talking to the client about it and sending the client on their own? Um, so tell me a little bit about how some of these other um, <clears throat> practices, you know, a lot of them are rural practices that just don't have all of the tools available to them or the expertise. Um, and as you know, I'm sure getting in with a, a board certified vet behaviors can take months. And sometimes people are at the end of their rope and can't wait months. So what are some ways that people can weave in and really put together a team without too much effort to help their clients in situations yeah, there's so many, so many layers to this conversation that we can absolutely dive into. And I think, you know, part of what comes to mind for me right at the beginning is really bringing it back to as, as simple a level as we possibly can. What are we trying to accomplish for this client, for this animal? And what tools do we have available? You know, just literally starting with the, uh, the simple questions. And I know that that's not always a simple question to answer. But you know, asking the question, is this a dog that I want to learn a few basic skills? You know, how to sit, how to come, how to follow some of those operant cues. If that's the case, then we probably have a lot of individuals that we might be able to choose from. And then we could kind of take that next step to say, and which methods are we going to be most comfortable utilizing? Utilizing the humane hierarchy and you know, meeting basic needs and then following with reinforcement-based training and so on. We can come at it from that angle. And if that first question was, gosh, we're not only needing to install some skills, but we also have some behaviors or emotional patterns that need to be modified in order to really prepare this animal for navigating its current environment. That to me then says we're probably looking for someone who has at least a slightly or significantly different skill set. Someone who has additional training as a consultant who can get to the heart of why those issues are happening and can help guide that client through the process of behavior modification. And again, second word is the important one here. Behavior is happening, but we're modifying, not just reprogramming. We're not just saying do this or else. We're actually saying, hey, buddy, <laughs> we got some other things we can do in this situation. And I can help you to do or feel differently. And that's a different skill set than the, the trainer. I'm not saying it's easier or harder necessarily. It's just a different toolbox. Right. And then we can talk about the veterinarian who's able to come at it from the medical angle and say, gosh, I can do a comprehensive physical exam. I can look at my test results. I can look at this and try to understand, is there something going on medically, physically, physiologically that we can address through those interventions. And then we get to the veterinary behaviorist, which I want to be very careful about how I say this, because in my perspective, even though I could say, yeah, I've got training as a trainer and as a behavior consultant, and as a veterinarian, I have all of the tools, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm not positioning myself at the top of the pyramid. I'm not saying that my opinion matters more than anyone else's because I have exposure to all of those tools. What I'm saying is I have a bigger toolbox. And so when I'm working with that particular client or that particular animal, yes, I have more tools available to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that mine is the definitive opinion. And sometimes I have a client who says, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think that's gonna work for us. <laughs> and I can say, well, no, I'm the veterinary behaviorist. So therefore, <laughs> I don't think that's a really effective way to do really any sort of consulting or, or, or counseling practice, but rather I could say, well, 
you don't think that's going to work for you, tell me more. What is it about that strategy or that approach that you feel has an obstacle for you to be able to implement that? Because gosh, like once I understand your obstacle, I may have the same reaction and go, oh my God, that's not going to work for you. There's no way you could possibly implement that. And let me go back into my toolbox and find something else that accomplishes the same goal, but utilizing a different methodology. And so when I think about sort of these individual roles, I don't necessarily assume that, you know, the sort of the average pet parent, whatever the average means here, but the pet parent mm -hmm. who's saying, hey, I need some help with my dog. I don't have necessarily a flow chart where I say, oh, you should always see your veterinarian first and then the trainer and then the consultants and then the veterinary behaviorist. It's more like, who, who do I have available <laughs> and what can they do for us? You know, even if it's that animal that's got a complicated emotional history, a really good trainer may be able to step in and start teaching some basic skills. Then they can start teaching that owner how to utilize reinforcement based methods. They may not have the full toolbox to, to address the medical issues or the full toolbox to really understand the emotional implications of what's going on, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something there that they can do. And so I think for these cases, it's a matter of saying, who do we have available? Who is accessible? And maybe we can't get into the veterinary behaviorists to get all of those tools but what do we have available? And maybe through the veterinary team, we're able to do a vet to vet consult and spend 30 minutes on the phone with that veterinary behaviorist to say, hey, here's what I've got. What are the top five things that I might want to consider right here, right now? I know it's not a comprehensive diagnostic and treatment plan, but we can probably do some really good work and advance that client and that animal from where they're starting from without necessarily saying, well, that'll be five months until you can get in to see the veterinary behaviorist because ain't nobody got five months to wait when you're in crisis. Nope. You just don't. And I like, that's where I start to feel that push pull because we're the same way, right? To get in as a new patient for the comprehensive assessment, it's usually eight to 12 weeks to wait. And, and we know that as well as everybody else, that that is not an option for many of our clients. And what we try to remain sort of aware of it and, and respecting to some degree is to say, if that client needs help, they will in fact be reaching out to whoever is available. And if we are not to some degree guiding them as to what the options are or how to make a choice between one professional versus another based on methodology, we're not really doing our job to guide them towards that appropriate solution. Because honestly, what I don't want to do is to leave that client high and dry. They reach mm. out to someone who might have a different methodology than I do. And now they're investing five months of time down a pathway that I get to them five months later. And I go, oh, ah. <laughs> this would have been a whole Whoops. lot easier had we addressed this five months ago, because now we've Oh, gosh, we've done some things that were probably not helpful and might have even been harmful to some degree. And now I'm potentially putting the client into a really sticky spot because they did what they were told. They did what they knew how to do. And now somebody is potentially judging them for that. I mean, it's just there, there's so many layers to this conversation. But I, I think to bring it back to simple, simple terms, what are we trying to accomplish? Who's available? And if there's a missing piece or a missing gap? How can we pull them in, in the time and the budget that we have available? What might that look like? And how can we give even one or two solid recommendations to allow that client to take one or two steps forward from where they are? And then let's reassess. Yeah, I think those recommendations are so important. I think networking with the trainers and the behavior professionals in the area is just, it's critical because as you said, you know, if they, if, if, if you don't have an answer for them, the client is going to go find their answer. So if they can't get in with the person you recommended for five months, three months, whatever the case may be, you know, some people in crisis are at the end of their rope. If I can't get in in the next week or two, I'm out. You know, we're going to be euthanizing this animal yes. or even worse, surrendering it and making it someone else's problem in a rescue. So um, I think that that's a really, really critical piece and not just knowing who's out there, but actually taking the time, just 10, 15 minutes at least, just to get to know some of these trainers and behavior professionals in your area so that you know who you can rely on, who you can't, 
you know, even put a staff member in charge of like read some reviews or reach out to some of the, the people you see on Facebook, leaving them comments or things like that, just to learn a little bit more about their methods, what they do and how they help and what maybe some of their success stories look like. You know, also, you know, there are a lot of trainers out there that do dabble in behavior. You know, there are some that um, specifically like fear aggressive cases. They're not behavior professionals per se, but they're dog trainers that have a specialty in one particular area. So it just helps to know what's available to you in your area and to kind of get to know that so that you have those resources. If the first thing that you offer your client isn't a viable option for them. Maybe it is a cost barrier, maybe it is a time barrier, but that way they're not out there on their own, potentially you know, falling under the wing of somebody else that might not be able to specifically address the need that that animal has and makes it <laughs> 10 times worse in yeah. the long run, which is really frustrating. And the other side of that is that it's so hard for a client at that point to trust the next person that comes along, even if the next person has exactly what they need and is going to help them and is going to really make this problem very manageable for them and they can lead a much lower stress life. The trust factor is already just, you know, obliterated because they've had a, a, a poor experience with someone that led them down the wrong path. So yes. I think that networking is so critical and just taking the time. Again, time always being the operative word, but taking the time to get to know people in the area so that you can have those tools available to you and you don't leave your clients on their own with something that's severe and is only going to get worse if it doesn't go in the right direction. Yeah. And that networking piece, I mean, I mean, I think you really hit the nail on the head with talking about time, right? Especially right now where everything takes longer than it feels like it should. And we're sort of scrambling to develop new behavior patterns and coping strategies and all of that. And yet... Having those relationships even sort of formed at a rudimentary level before the need arises is so helpful, so helpful. And, you know, and I struggle with this because I'm, I'm a person who really, I do struggle to maintain something, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a new data point, unless I can immediately put it into practice. So I mm. tend to form those relationships sort of on demand. Ooh, I have a need that I have to meet. Who can I reach out to? And then yes. that relationship gets formed. And yet it's also in some cases the hardest way to do it because now we're under a time crunch. We're trying to scramble to, to make sense of the best we've got in that moment. And it's not always going to really serve us to that best degree. And so I'm always thinking, okay, you know, and we do this as a veterinary team all the time where I say, okay, if, if a, a cancer patient comes my way, who are my oncologists, whether they're regional, local, or, you know, on the other side of the country, and I need to do a phone consult, who are my oncologists, who are my ophthalmologists, who are my physical therapists, who are my massage therapists, if, if PT isn't the right option, who's my orthopedist, who's my, we have these networks already based on the needs when we recognize that as general practitioners or even a specialist in one discipline, there is no way for me to have all the tools. It's never going to happen. I'm setting myself and my clients and my patients up for failure by assuming or projecting that I may have all those tools. So I've got to be really clear about what I can and can't do. And really then say, if this goes beyond me, then what? And it's not my responsibility as a veterinarian to, to take on the weight of all of those cases and to really sort of bear the brunt of now it's my case. Now it's my responsibility. My job as a professional is to do my, my absolute best to assess and to recommend. And then I have to step away. And that's also like a conflict piece for me because I'm in this profession because of the love for what I do, both client and animal. And so it's so easy to get pulled into the emotional weight and attaching my own personal and professional value to the outcome of the case in front of me. And guess what? That's not sustainable. I can attach my value to my efforts. I cannot attach my value to the outcome outcomes out of my control. I just got to do the best. Yeah, there's just too many variables there. Too many, too variables, many variables there. And everybody yeah. has their part and their role. And you, and, and that's, that's a really good point. You have a very specific role in that. And that's what you, that's your control factor right there. Not anything else that's going on in that world at that time. Yeah. And yet yeah. I also understand the client and the, whether we're talking about training or medical issues, clients want clarity. Hmm. 
right? Clarity creates confidence. Clarity creates less anxiety. I understand the client who's looking at us saying, but what do I do? And whether they're asking that question of a trainer, a behavior consultant, a behaviorist, a veterinarian, the need exists. And I get that. And I respect that. And the moment I step in and say, well, in these circumstances, you should do something. I'm immediately stepping into a position that I probably shouldn't be in. I can help that client to say, under these circumstances, these are the options and these are the potential outcomes of choosing option A versus B versus C. Just like we would do, again, thinking about the medical profession, if, if an animal comes in and we diagnose them with, let's say, lymphoma, it's not my job to say, well, you should do chemo. <laughs> No, no, should that, is that magical word? Yeah, if you're if you're right? uttering that magical should word, yep. Mm -hmm. No, and even if you're thinking the tone, well, I mean, the best option would be this. Best for who? Best for what? You know. Mm -hmm. But I can say, yeah, if you choose chemo, this is the you know the likely outcome. This is the likely cost. These are the potential complications. If you choose not to do that, this is the cost. These are the potential outcomes. These are the potential complications. If you choose somewhere in the middle of you know, again, we can help them sort of walk them through the options and provide that clarity that they need without necessarily putting them into a situation where we have perhaps inappropriately guided what they, quote unquote, should do. And I say that not only for the medical side, because I think we actually do a pretty good job of that most of the time on the medical side. But for whatever reason, when we tip over to behavior and we start talking about relationships, especially if we start getting into things like quality of life issues or mm. perhaps aggression and safety issues, and we start telling clients what they should do to maintain safety, uh-uh-uh. Like, again, my bias, this is my opinion. <laughs> I can talk to that client and say, under these circumstances, these are options that will mitigate those safety risks. These are options that will allow us to modify behavior. What do you want to do? Where do we go forward? Well, and looking at it that way really removes that judgment piece. So say you tell someone you should do this and then they can't because they have whatever barrier that you're not aware of because they're afraid to communicate that with you based on the should and that judgment piece yes. and they fail at it. And then oftentimes with that failure comes just shame like, oh, I did this wrong. I didn't follow directions. It's my fault. And there's all this wound up guilt that gets you absolutely nowhere when it comes to progress. Yes. So I like that it's it's really putting it very clearly. You know, you're providing that clarity like a, B, and C are our options here. And this is what happens when we travel down path A. Here's what happens when we meander down path B. And over here in C, this is what we have here. Like, it's just very clear and cut. And you're leaving those decisions into the hands of the client. After all, it is their companion. It is their family member. It is not ours. And so I do try, and it's very hard, like, to catch yourself in this. But unless somebody says to me, okay, this is your dog, what would you do? Well, just because I would do it for my dog doesn't mean you should do it for your dog. There's the word, should. <laughs> um, but then in, in that case, I would feel comfortable saying, well, for, for my dog, I would do this, but my house is this and, and I have different parameters for things. And, you know, I have four kids and you have zero kids or you have 10 kids and I have four kids or whatever the case yes. may be. Everyone's situation is so very different. So just because you would do something one way for your particular animal doesn't mean someone else can or should. And yeah. I think that failure piece is just crippling. So in, in putting the weight of that on a client can can really be crippling when it comes to feeling like they've failed a member of their family. So yes. I love that. Just that clear cut. Here's what we can do. Here's what your options are. You really have to choose what's best, yeah. you know, for you and your animal. I can and guide you. But yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I even take it in for many of my cases, I take it one step further when I get that. You know, what would you do? <laughs> my first response to that is to typically one of two things, kind of flip-flopping the order depending on how the conversation has gone, but often acknowledging it means a lot to me that you're asking my opinion. Like yeah. we're in a relationship here. And that does I I I take that very uh seriously that you're asking that opinion. And the honest answer to the what would you do question is I don't know. Because of mm. all of those reasons that you just said. 
I don't have your budget. I don't have your skill set. I don't have your relationship with this animal. I don't have your motivations. I don't have your kids. I don't have your husband. I don't have your wife. I don't have your house. I don't have your bank account. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Because any one of those variables that changes might dramatically impact the what would I do? So what I tend to do in that case is say, I actually don't know what I would do. Given what you've shared with me, these are some of the variables that would likely impact my decision. And then I can circle back around to that A, B, and C option. And that gets me away from that. I don't know, but here's the option. <laughs> For me, it's an I don't know, period. And. Here are some of the things that may factor into our decision. And what I love about that, I mean, truly from a, from a, well, there's a lot of self-preservation involved in that decision process, because for me, it allows me to really show up in my, in my best self and I can share the information and the knowledge and the options that exist. And I can then hand that over to the client for their ultimate responsibility of making the decision. It helps me to not carry the weight for those outcomes, as we were talking about earlier. And it also puts the decision where the decision needs to be made. And, and for better or for worse, animals are property that are under the control and the decision of their owners and caregivers. And, you know, that's a whole other thing that we could get into in a deep dive about whether that's appropriate or not. But the reality is, it's not my decision as the veterinarian, the veterinary behaviorist, the trainer, the behavior consultant. It's not my decision what they should do, except in very, very rare cases where there may be a safety risk to a vulnerable population or something about that case where the animal is not being managed in such a way as to maintain public safety. Then I might need to take a slightly different tact and say, nah, this, you know, really the responsibility here, what needs to happen to maintain safety is X, Y, and Z. Can you do that? But I'm still not using the should work. Yes, so. but there's that there's that open-ended question. Can you do that? You're not yes. just leaving these instructions in their hand. You're expecting some feedback to really open that conversation rather than just saying, here you go, you're on your own. <laughs> like, go. This is what your dog is unsafe in society. Do this, you know, but you, you yeah. get that feedback and that can really open the door to some of those barriers potentially too. So if you're asking those open-ended questions, you know, there might be some things that, you know, your client is going to give you feedback about. Like when you walk out the door, your, you know, 110 pound aggressive Great Dane is on a retractable leash. Well, you know, right from the get go, we can say a few things like, can you consider maybe some different equipment? Is yes. that something that you're able to do? You know, just starting with pieces like that to where you can get some feedback from them. Well, no, I can't because I don't get my check until next Friday. You know what? I've got a couple of spare in the back. Would you like one? You know, just leaving it up to them and in their hands, but at least you know, again, taking the judgment piece out and letting them know that it is ultimately their decision, but then just not leaving them to their own devices without a potential solution for some of the barriers they might be thinking about in their head, but just not expressing essentially. Yeah. And what you, I, what you hit on there, Sarah, I think is so profound that especially when we're talking about a professional and a pet owner, whoever that professional is, trainer, behavior consultant, behaviorist, veterinarian, whatever, there is that weight that comes in and, and potentially the embarrassment or the guilt or the shame, the vulnerability that it requires to show up and say, I actually don't know what to do. I'm really struggling here. And when someone in a professional role gives a set of, of, of recommendations or a piece of advice, there's often that implied, here is what you do. And if that client is, as you said, I don't get paid till next Friday. You know, that's only $20 for a new leash. Guess what? I don't have it. And, and if that's the only thing that I've given them is you need to go to the store and buy it. And the client says, but I, I, I can't. And now I don't have a way to move forward. All right. Don't know how to move forward. We haven't really done them a, you know, a, a full service. We haven't helped them as much as we potentially could have done versus asking some of the open ended questions. Hey, I think, you know, different equipment, whatever that happens to be, could really be an option here. How does that land for you? Are you open to new equipment? Can we, can we give that a try? I got three minutes here. Let's, let's, let's grab a different leash and let's see what that looks like for your animal. Can we do that? Is that an option? Can you do that? And 
honestly, another question is, do you want to? You know, if the client's like, I'm really attached to my retractable leash and maybe I have the money to go to the store, but quite honestly, I don't want to. I just <laughs> plain, plain don't want to. Then great. As a practitioner, that's really helpful feedback. And then I can, if I have the time and the space and the knowledge and the credentials and whatever, I can dive that next step, next step in and say, well, you know, what's the obstacle? You know, what is it about the retractable leash that you really, really love? Because I might be able to teach you how to use a long line safely that establishes a more consistent distance and increases our level of management and safety while still giving you the ability to let that dog out 20 feet when you're in a safe space, when you have long uh, unrestricted sight lines. So I may be able to accomplish and give you everything you love about your retractable while also accomplishing what I'm trying to do in improving your situation and your management. But I got to know what your obstacle is in order to really tease that out. Yeah, that's perfect. And and I think that really helps clients feel more comfortable in accepting the advice that you are going to give or some of the information that you are going to present them because you're not just automatically saying, don't do this, don't use that, let's get rid of this, let's not do that. It's like, okay, well, we can talk about this. Okay, this is what you have. This is what you work with. This is why. Um, so let's explore that a little bit more. <clears throat> and even if you really feel that an equipment change is necessary or a methodology in your training style is necessary, it really helps to just kind of not bombard them with that up front to where if you get in the door and you start teaching and you start explaining and you're really working with them, then some of those things tend to fall in line, as you could say, um, as you move along and as you build trust with them and as they're willing to open their doors and try new things. So as they're yes. trying a variety of different things, they might find something that works better than that, what they were doing before. But sometimes they really have to see that in order to get it. You know, it's like, I always laugh because I'm one of those people that has to learn things the hard way. You can tell me until I'm blue in the face, but I'm going to try it anyway, right? So, and I think a lot of people are like that too, but this is the way I've done it. This is the way I've always done it. My daddy did it this way and my mom does it this way and my aunt did too, and they were fine. (laughs) It's never been a problem until now. So I think a lot of it too is just letting people try it, test it, see what other options are available. Well, I know you do it this way, but try this too. See if this works. If that doesn't work, let's try this too. And let them find something among your practice, your teachings that really clicks with them and gets them excited about trying something new, trying something different. I love a story came to mind when we were talking, we were talking here about sort of methodology and and tool shifts. This was a dog I saw, you know, gosh, probably, I I think this dog is maybe probably seven or eight years old now. Um, I I saw her first as an adolescent and she was a high energy Vizsla, which I know is sort of redundant to say in, you know, in, in, in context, but you know, adolescent, high energy, literally bouncing off the walls in the consult room. And so I was talking with this client about some of the tools and, and they had tried a bunch of different things, as many clients have done. And they'd had previous dogs before, including high energy beastless. And what they had in their toolbox wasn't working. I said, let's just play a little bit. So we dived in and I, I just started doing some basic marking and rewarding just to give that dog some feedback. And she was actually probably one of the fastest responders that I've ever seen. We're getting just a couple little, yes, treats. And she went from literally sort of climbing the walls of the consult room to lying at my feet in about <laughs> 90 seconds. And I was like... I love when that happens. <laughs> right. I was like, well, this is just magic, right? It just it proves that it worked. But so we, so that opened up a conversation where the clients were like, what, what sort of magical sedative did you just slip my dog? And you sorcerer. So, yes. Right. And so then we had the opportunity to have the conversation about, oh, I gave her really consistent feedback about what I was ready to pay her for. And so we, you know, sort of opened the conversation to reinforcement and so on. And we, we onboarded a couple of sc- uh, skills and, and tools and, 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 and sort of sent them on their way. And I got a call from the, the the trainer that they had been working with, a great reinforcement-based trainer, uh, sort of remote to where we are. And she said, I am just dying to know, how did you get these clients to give up their shock collar? <laughs> and I remember my reaction was, I uh, I actually didn't know they were using a shock collar. It never <laughs> came up in our conversation. But then I sort of replayed it. And what we had talked about was they were asking, you know, well, what do I do? when she screws up what do i do when she makes a mistake and so we just had a conversation i just well you know you you could use a correction but is that really giving her the feedback of what we wanted her to do in the first place or would it have been better in that example that you're giving me where she sees you know geese in the pond and goes diving in would it have been perhaps more successful to have her on the long line at first 
show her what I want her to do. And if at some point we need to circle back to round to giving some sort of correction or aversive, if we need to, we've really guaranteed that we've given her the, the educational framework to know what was appropriate in that circumstance. So just ask yourself, does she know what's appropriate or are we just telling her no? And then we just, we left it. We circled back around to reinforcement-based stuff to establish that learning foundation. Never once talked about shock collars or remote activated devices. And they got <laughs> home and said, well, wait a minute. I'm utilizing a shock collar after the fact. And I'm not confident that this dog knows what she was supposed to do in the first place. Let me put the remote down until I've onboarded appropriate skills. And it was all a matter of just having a non-judgmental conversation versus if I had walked in and said, put that remote down, take that collar off. That is a tool we do not use here. We are not going to do that. I potentially not, not only could have violated the trust that that client placed in me as a professional, but I may have actually made that situation worse if that tool was perhaps the only thing that was giving them some degree of control or safety in that environment. And I took it away from them on some sort of moral high horse about we just shouldn't do that. I can't take that away, in my opinion, until I've given them tools that work better than what they've already got. And then I can make that existing tool that I want to phase out. I can make that obsolete by giving them better tools. But simply taking the tool away without first onboarding, uh -uh, yeah. it's not going to help. Well, that's such a parallel. Exactly what you're saying right there, the parallel of of um, taking the tool away without the teaching of what else to do and telling the dog no without telling it what to do. You know, it's the human dog parallel. Like you can tell them no, 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 no all day. And they're like, ah, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, it's just trial and error. I'm just going to try this. No. Oh, okay. So now I'm just going right. to randomly try something else. So yes, you have to have those yeses. This is what I want. This is the behavior I like. Yes, I want to see more of this. So giving them that, yes, this is what we do do. And same thing with the humans. Like, I just took this away. No, we don't use this. No, we don't do this. No, we don't talk about that. Um, it's so important that it's more of the yes camp. Like yes. this is a behavior that I, this, this is a method that I've found that works in a dog like yours because, you know, and kind of giving them that more robust why behind what it is that you're teaching them or telling them or asking to, them to try essentially is here are all of the yeses. Here are the, the things that we should, tr or that I want to try. I'm going to watch that word. I'm telling you. Um, <laughs> all of the things that that would be good options potentially. And here's why I think they would be good options. So now you at least have some direction instead of no, don't use this, take that off your dog. Don't ever do that here, that kind of thing. So you're yeah. providing the human some direction and you're providing the dog some direction too with knowing what should I do instead? Like I can't just no, 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 no all along the way. You know, it's right. not very effective. Yeah, no, it's exactly right. And giving that, giving that direction, I'll, you know, sometimes give clients the analogy of you know, giving them directions. If I said, you know, turn right out of the parking lot, go half a block, turn left, drive a mile, turn right, you're probably going to end up where I put you. Versus if I say, get in your car, don't turn left. Whatever you do, don't take the little dirt road. Like you've got a client who's also kind of flying blind, right? You're sort of hoping they land in the right spot, but there's so many other places they could land. And yet, if I give them the majority of my instructions, if something is still distracting or getting them off course, might there be a time where I might say, uh-uh, left hand, left hand turn, remember? Left, left. Oh, nicely done. Good job. <laughs> I can give them a little bit of that binary feedback to sort of get them back on course, but I'm not teaching through the use of the aversive. I'm teaching through the reinforcement and giving proactive direction. I might be redirecting in pretty uncommon cases, truthfully, when an, when an animal, human or otherwise, understands what is the best way forward, the thing that's going to pay off in whatever their reinforcer is, the vast majority of the time, that's what they do because it works. If they're not doing that, then that's our opportunity as the teacher to say, wait a minute, did I give them all of the information they needed to choose the option that I think is best for them in this circumstance versus jumping to the aversive more quickly? And we could you know, dive into the humane hierarchy and where aversives fall and where they don't fall and all of that stuff. But truthfully, I have to ask the question, have I set the foundation to expect or even predict that the animal would choose the desired option in this particular case or not. And if I haven't, then that's on me as the educator.
And I'm going to say the same thing for my clients. If they're consistently choosing options that aren't in alignment with my values or my recommendations, I could yell at them. I could shame them. I could blame them. But that's probably not going to get them back on track. I can explore and say, wait a minute, did I actually give them the recommendations in a way that was meaningful for them? Did I ask whether this was doable? Did I ask whether this actually landed well for them and they understand what to do going forward? If I haven't, cool. Now I know what my opportunity is for my canine learners, my feline learners, my my human learners. It's the same, same, same. Yeah. And it's interesting too, with the recommendations, um, one of the things that I, I always find a little bit interesting is that we've progressed in our recommendations as far as what to do with training, even in the veterinary practice. You know, you, you, I hear a lot of people talk all the time about positive reinforcement and really kind of pushing that forward, but yet you walk back in the treatment room and you see, you know, a dog kind of being restrained harder and harder and being forced into a position. And so it's, it's almost one of those things where, not just the practice what you preach kind of thing, but it flows into every environment. It flows into every situation. And understanding that you're leading by example, by the things that you do in your own practices and how that can filter in and out of your recommendations for your clients. So while you're thinking, oh, I want to recommend a positive reinforcement trainer, you know, for example, for my client that has a, a, a dog that's suffering from fear anxiety, um, that same dog that has fear anxiety is also in the back of your hospital as well. And so thinking yeah. about how you're approaching just your handling skills and your and and what you're going to do with that animal while you have them there makes a difference on how things go for behavior modification outside of your practice as well. So I think that's yes. just really important to to think about because I think sometimes that can get lost in the mix of you know the everyday ins and outs of what's going on in the treatment area that your your recommendations outside of the clinic should also be practiced inside of the clinic um, f- from that perspective as well when you're talking about a, a dog that you're trying to to make recommendations for and kind of help them down the path of success. Yeah. So I do want to ask you a little bit too, um, I want to circle back around and talk to you a little bit about um, why we make recommendations against certain practices. You know, obviously we, uh, you hear the word science thrown about like crazy now because it's our new favorite buzzword when it comes to behavior, but there's something to be said about that. I feel like it's like, you know, um, the new, the new entrepreneur, like everybody used to never say the word entrepreneur. And I was like this big thing and everybody wants to be one. Oh, you don't, by the way. Um, but <laughs> it's so much harder I, than it looks on the outside. Yeah, it's so much harder. It is not, it's not the, the fast jet in Dubai. It is late nights in your pajamas, eating Cheetos for dinner. Just you get like to choose ER. which, right. You get to choose which 14 hours of the day you work. That's the value of being an entrepreneur. Is it? Is that, that's how it goes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you nobody's setting your schedule. Which... <laughs> <laughs> so um, being that science is the new buzzword, um, I hear it. I just, I almost, I, I get scared that I hear it misused a lot. But part of the thing, the reason I bring that up is because we do in our practices make recommendations against certain methodologies based on what research and what science is showing us and is telling us as to what is truly effective when it comes to the well-being of an animal um, and what is not. And so trying to portray that to people can often be very difficult, especially people who have grown up doing things in a very traditional manner or old school manner. And I, I can tell you firsthand, I used to train very differently than I do now. I had a completely different understanding of that kind of human canine dynamic. And I have a much better appreciation for that relationship, that mutual relationship now than I did growing up because that's what I grew up around. So the reason I bring this up is because when it comes to leading by example, not just in the veterinary practice, but now we see things on TV, like this new Netflix series that's out there. Um, there's a there's a show called Canine Intervention where um, you don't get to see a lot of the methodology that's used. And there's a lot of concern about leading by example, by making people think that this is okay to do to your animal to get the results that you think that you want, um, as opposed to working on some of the root issues of why these behaviors are happening and tackling it from the animal's perspective rather than forcing it from a human perspective. So though this is kind of one of those really kind of fuzzy areas and the the word that we love today, the, the word of the day, the shoulds, a lot of that kind of comes into play here, but there is reason that we recommend against certain practices and there is reason that we get concerned that people will see certain practices in use and then try to emulate those practices. And then that can have some pretty disastrous results. Um, I kind of align it with the thing of of just throwing all the tools on the shelf at the pet store and being like, here, pick your tool, whether it's an electric fence, an electric collar, a prong collar, a gentle leader, a harness, an easy walk, here they all are, have fun, go for it. You know, leaving them to their own devices when 
These are things that require specific use for specific purposes. So kind of give me a little bit of your take on that. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really important concept to have. And for all of the foundation that you just established there, I think it's an important concept. And and as a as a veterinary behaviorist, I think it's my obligation to have a really fluent understanding of how all of those tools work. So that I could look at any one of those tools on the shelf and say, okay, well, if I was choosing that particular tool, whether it's the harness, whether it's the head collar, whether it's, you know, a, a shock based device, whether it's behavior activated or remote activated, I should, here I go. I <laughs> have the obligation to understand what appropriate or inappropriate use of any of those tools would look like. Because even if I'm not recommending certain tools, chances are my clients might come into me utilizing them. And back to what we were talking about before, if I'm going to try to convince them otherwise or give them tools that accomplish the same reason that they reached for that particular tool, I got to know what we're aiming for. So I think, you know, in certain cases, and this comes back to more the, the trainer or the behavior consultant role, if I just say, well, I would never utilize X, Y, or Z, and therefore I'm blocking myself off to all information about the pros and cons and the assets and the limitations and the fallout and the blah, 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 blah. I'm probably not expanding my toolbox as much as I could. Now, that doesn't mean I have to go run out and shock 400 dogs to gain that practical experience. I can learn about this based on, as you said, the science that exists, you know, even taking it back to the principles of reinforcement consequences versus punishment or aversive based consequences. And whether that's, you know, we could get into quadrants and that whole mishmash of all of the things about what, what we do and how we do it. But the reality is, is that I want to really have a, a, a fundamental understanding of how all these pieces fit together, first and foremost. And then I'm able to then say, okay, well, wait a minute, what does science tell us about sort of our fundamentals? And I tend to go back just in my own brain. I love looking at the hierarchy of behavior change, looking at that example of basically saying, have I met this animal's basic needs first? Sleep, nutrition, exercise, safety. Have I done that? If the answer there is yes, awesome. Move on. And then I can start looking at some reinforcement based methods to be able to answer that question. Have I given this animal feedback about what they can do to earn reinforcement in some way, shape or form? And it's really easy to immediately assume that reinforcement means food. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case if you don't want to use food. And if your dog's reinforcers happen to be something different, awesome. Use what's reinforcing to your animal but you're giving them some consequences in a positive way that really shifts their behavior in the direction that you want it to go anyway. If I've done that, then I move on to the next level of saying, okay, have I now given them some differential reinforcement of, I'm gonna kind of ignore that piece because I don't wanna feed into that, but yes, every time you do this thing, I'm now starting to guide your behavior. And there, there's a hierarchy based on not only efficacy, but also the likelihood of creating emotional or physical trauma. And I think we, we often focus on the physical trauma without necessarily acknowledging the emotional trauma. We yes, on this repeat little, that. Repeat yes, that. We, we often focus exclamation on the physical point. trauma. Exclamation <laughs> point. I can jump up and down and do all yes. the things here in my whole office. But the emotional trauma of the experience of learning through different methods is real. And that, in my experience, has as much or greater impact on what that animal does the next time around. And what I really have to focus on when I start to go down that pathway is really thinking about what am I using to measure success with my training method? Was success the absence of a behavior? So if I correct that dog for jumping or for pulling, and I'm now not seeing jumping or pulling, it's super easy and actually kind of a simple, straightforward to look, the way to look at it, say, well, that worked, right? That accomplished exactly what I wanted it to do. And as busy, stressed out humans, it's very easy for us to go into problem solving mode and say, there's a behavior here that's a problem for me. The solution I need is the one that gets rid of the problem behavior. And when we do that through a corrective or suppressive method, it works. Anybody who says that punishment doesn't work 
I think doesn't really understand the science. It absolutely works when your measure of success is whether or not that particular behavior was expressed. And what else did it do? Yes. And that's the piece that I want to be able to kind of then dive into and say, okay, so we're no longer seeing pulling or jumping. What replaced it? If the heart rate is 20% higher, I replaced it with stress. Mm -hmm. If the animal is now inhibited and is not actually engaging in normal species, typical behavior, I suppressed it with sort of the absence or I, I, I success is now sort of the absence of behavior. It wasn't as though I created a learning paradigm where the animal said, ah, oh, that doesn't pay off. I'm going to do this instead. And we still see loose shoulders and a soft waggy tail and the freedom to, well, the freedom to behave. I've suppressed it. Was it successful? Yes. As long as my measure of success was the presence or absence of a behavior and what else came along for the ride. And that requires us to, I think, be a lot more, well, critical. I don't see that in a judgmental way, but critical thought to say, wait a minute, bigger picture. Let me pull that lens out just a little bit further and look at what I'm utilizing as my measures. And, and that for me allows me to say, gosh, you know, while punishment could have worked here to suppress or to eliminate that behavior, I'm a little bit concerned about the possibility of seeing fear, anxiety, or stress as a consequence. And what I'll also, you know, acknowledge is that I am aware in my own personal learning history where either I have experienced a punishment or something aversive happened to a learner and we didn't see for whatever reason, we didn't see all of that fallout that we're worried about. And so in my mind, this is, well, some, sometimes I can get away with using a correction or a suppressive method without seeing that fallout. So can I roll the dice and try it and then see what happens? And what I try to really, really remember is that it's not up to me as the trainer what the emotional experience of my learner will end up being. And if applying that aversive or whatever is aversive to that animal, if that created a traumatic experience, I can't go back. I can't just go, oops, nope, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, Spot. Nope, I can't do that. Rewind 30 minutes ago. Let's try this again. I've now created a learning history. And we, you know, well, I certainly have plenty of examples in my own practice where even one or two unpleasant or aversive experiences changed behavior for the lifetime of the animal. And so when I go back to my veterinary oath, sort of do no harm, kind of really boiling down the long, long, long oath, above all else, do no harm, I can't in good conscience lead out a training plan with an aversive because there's a really high probability, not a guarantee, but there's a high probability that I'm going to create an emotional experience that is damaging to the individual. And if in recommending that I have done harm, that actually doesn't work for me ethically, professionally, responsibly. And so that is my nudge to go, wait a minute, which rungs of that humane hierarchy did I skip? to jump to that corrective method. And whether that's something as quote unquote benign as the squirt bottle for the cat on the counter, or whether mm -hmm. it's the benign leash correction on, on a walk, they're not necessarily benign. It's the emotional experience of the learner that determines the level of aversiveness that is within them. And so as professionals, it's our opportunity. And I would argue our obligation to say before that, this, this is how we go coming back to that science-based decision tree, just like we do in the rest of vet med. I wouldn't automatically say, well, you know, this thing worked one time and it didn't cause any problems. So I'm going to do that same thing for the rest of my patients. No, like there's a process. There's a reason why we do certain things first and then move on from there. But we've got to be able to, to, to look at that critically. And again, I I always want to say critically, not not with judgment or self-judgment, but really with critical thought and evaluating the options of why we would choose one versus another. And that is our guiding principles for how we do behavior work, just as we do medical practice. 
Yes, and having that hierarchy is really important to the to the individual itself. You know, you're talking about the individual learner in particular, and and all dogs handle things very, very differently based on their genetics, how they were raised, what happened to them during their critical period, what didn't happen to them during their critical period. So, just because something works for one and it seems to be okay, it could completely ruin or shut down another dog. And you're right, you can't put that back in the box once you've already done it. Um, and often I feel that people that jump straight to for example, an aversive method, a punishment-based method, because they've seen it work in the past, it's a very human-driven goal, objective, so to say, whereas you're not necessarily taking into account what could potentially happen to the dog. It's very much, I want this behavior to stop, here's what I'm gonna do about it. But you have to take into account the fact that dogs aren't inanimate objects. This is a creature that you're going to affect one way or another, you're gonna shape one way or another, and are you willing to deal with the risk of potentially not being able to readjust that in an appropriate way once you've already done something specifically to that animal? So yeah. that individual approach, I think, is just so important in deciding what you're going to do or what you're not going to do. And, and is this a canine and human driven decision or is this simply just a human driven decision? Yes. It's something that I often stress to my veterinary students you know, when I'm teaching sort of the foundations of, of behavior and within the field of veterinary behavior is really stressing the fact that the learner, whether it's them, my students in class, or whether it's the animal we're working with, they deserve the opportunity to be told what to do before I correct them for doing it wrong. They deserve that. That is their right, if you will. That is something that by, by really doing well by the learner itself, they deserve that opportunity before I arbitrarily jump to something else, for sure. Exactly. It's, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. So tell me, um, tell me what you're teaching this year. How can people that want to learn more and dive more into what you're out there spreading all of this goodness in the world, how can they get involved? Are you offering courses? Um, what conferences this year can we expect you at? How can people yeah, so it's a great question. So there are a couple of different things. So I, I'm grateful to say, and this is a little sidebar, um, I teach at three different veterinary schools in the U.S. Obviously, that's restricted to the veterinary students. But I'm often yes. asked, hey, what education are we providing to the veterinary teams? I'm doing the best I can. I've got contracts at three <laughs> of the universities. I'm like, I'm influencing about 10% of our graduating veterinarians in the in the U.S. right now. And I'm I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. So so Excellent. that is happening in the background. We're trying, we're trying, we're trying. Um, and then also- We just need a clone. We just need you to go ahead and clone yourself. We'll right, more seven more, and then we'll, then we'll <laughs> have the whole, the whole industry covered. No, so we've got, you know, that is happening in the background. Um, I am participating in the Fetch DVM 360 series this year. And so we're crossing fingers that as of Indianapolis, which I think is in June, we're actually moving towards an in-person hybrid model. Super exciting. And then the second yeah. half of the year doing more in-person as well. So you can find me on those uh, educational platforms. Um, I'm participating in the Lemonade Conference, uh, which is in May, uh, participating in the Aggression in, Dog Con Aggression in Dogs Conference, which I believe is October. Yep. Um, that, so that's going to be happening favorites. as well. Uh, it's going to be so good. I'm, I'm super excited. Mm -hmm. And the platform that we're utilizing this year should be super cool. Um, more on that on the website. Uh, and then you can always find web, uh, webinars and other educational offerings. I do my best to keep promoting those through social media channels. So you can find me on Instagram or Facebook. And I do put those those offerings up as regularly as I can without annoying people. Um, <laughs> so I do that. And then you can also track down some of the things that I've done historically, podcasts like this one, as well as other videos and educational opportunities. You can track all of those down through my website, which is drpockel.com, D-R-P-A-C-H-E-L.com. Especially if you go to the media tab, you'll find all of the, the resources that are out there for consumption. Um, and yeah, and then just sort of see where that takes us, right? The opportunities are changing every single day, uh, especially through these last 12 to 18 months. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited that uh, we get the opportunity to really do some just amazing projects just like this one. A lot going on. That's really fantastic. And congrats on the new dog training business as well. 
Um, I will definitely put all the links you mentioned in the show notes and the comments below um, so that people can access that directly and go check out what you're doing and sign up for some of those conferences. The ones you mentioned, I've been a part of all those and they're fantastic. Those are really, really good platforms for just soaking up as much knowledge in a short amount of time as you can from some really cool experts on different topics. So I'll definitely put all of those links down below and all your socials too, so people can uh, follow you, stalk you, and continue learning from you. <laughs> that sounds Dr. fantastic. Dr. Bockel, uh, you're such a delight and you're absolutely brilliant. And I love everything that you bring to the behavior table and more. So thank you so very much for joining me today. Um, if you want, feel free to keep an eye out on any questions that pop up um, on the podcast and feel free to jump in and answer those if you like. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks so much for your time today. This was great. This was a ton of fun. I appreciate the opportunity. And, and wow, I mean, we really hit on some really, I think, deep and important topics today. Uh, in, in a way that I, I think people listening will, will hopefully really resonate with and, and know that, gosh, we've, we've done so much. We've advanced so much, even in the last decade or so. And to some degree, I feel like we're just getting started with what exists as potential. So hang on. It's going to be a fun ride. It is. And I think uh, hopefully a lot of people walk away from this, hearing this conversation, feeling hopeful that there's a lot of resources available, a lot of tools available, and that um, there, you can do a lot to really help your clients and build that trust in that relationship. So thanks Agreed. for helping me spread that good word. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Take care. <laughs> you as well. 